Okay, here we go. Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get going. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, depending on how you count, our fourth open force field workshop or the fourth one since we uh, began the open force field consortium. And uh, sad to say, this is our, the second of those, which is virtual apparently. Jeff, can you flip to the next slide? So uh, I'm just going to be kicking things off here today, um, just briefly, and then we're mainly going to hear from first Jeff Wagner and then Simon Boothroyd, and then I'll kind of wrap things up with uh, some, some summary at the end, and then we'll have ample time for discussion. The plan is that this session, the first the talk, the formal talk will be recorded, and then we'll turn off recording for discussion so that um, everybody can be candid. And as we'll talk about later, well, let's go on to the next slide. So the idea is that we would um, yeah, have an hour of talk, an hour of discussion and Q&A, and we'll titrate between how much of that is discussion and how much is Q&A. And then you can put in your requests for what you wanna hear more about, and we'll schedule some times for talks on those in the coming weeks so that we don't have to block out a huge amount of time today for things that we think you wanna hear about and maybe be wrong, We'll actually talk to you about what you most want to hear about. And so we'll pull for that during the Q&A time. Next slide. So just to jump right into it, we started officially in late 2018, um, October 2018. But so we'll call our first year the 2019 year. And a key part of that first year was building out the infrastructure here, uh, the Open Force Field Toolkit and Evaluator that you'll hear more about, deals with condensed space properties. Um, we're interacting with force balance, QC archive data sets, and so on. I won't work through the whole workflow right now, but we spent a lot of time on infrastructure. And really at the end of that, that first project year, we ended up fitting about three or four force fields within a couple of months to release Open Force Field 1.0. So automation has been a key part of what we've done. And as you'll see today, it's really starting to pay off a lot. We'll go on to the next one. Um, so since that Open Force Field 1.0 release, which was codenamed Parsley, we've had a series of fixes and improvements in between that and our Sage release, which is coming shortly, and you'll hear about today, we have a release candidate out. So 1.1 involves some more valence parameter refits and some fixes. 1.2 was a full refit, uh, by which had a lot of data set redesign that went into it um, to improve accuracy. Then we had a series of, of specific fixes and issues addressed um, in response to challenges and problems that came up. At the same time that we've been doing a lot of new science, really we've done tens to hundreds of fitting experiments to test out a wide range of ideas, like the effect of vibrational frequency fitting versus Hessian fitting versus not fitting to either and all kinds of other things. And you'll hear about some of those today. Next slide. 
So um, also, we're working a lot on the infrastructure side. Jeff will be talking quite a bit about different aspects of this. And just to call out one of those, we're, we're bringing out our new interchange object soon. So we've been relying previously on an OpenMM system as representing a parameterized object. And we're switching to having our own object, which will probably be OpenFF interchange. And that will replace our system, replace um, ParMed in terms of converting to other files, and also allow interaction with machine learning um, and other frameworks. And you'll hear more about that. Next slide. Then also, we now have ready a Sage release candidate, and you're going to hear about some of what's gone into that today. It does better on mixture and condensed phase properties because it includes a refit of the Leonard Jones. And then in tests, that appears to result in improvements for salvation free energies, both aqueous, non aqueous, and transfer free energies, even though it wasn't fitted to those. Um, and this will allow us in the future to train small molecule force fields and others um, and, and biomolecular force field self-consistently. So we're really excited about that and you'll hear more about that. Next slide. Then a big focus has been on automated benchmarking working together with industry and we're really excited about how that team has come together and we've been able to do things both on public molecules and on internal industry proprietary molecules to assess performance. And it looks like um, both our first force fields are looking pretty good, but also our stage release candidate actually looks like an improvement, even though it's our first force field with refit Leonard Jones. And you'll hear more about that in what's to come too. So next slide. The other big, another big thing that's changing is we're switching from a, thinking about force field, the force field development process as one where we come up with an idea and then we implement it and uh, fit it and then release the force field and then test it and then release that to you. One where we kind of were, we have a single idea and it's going to end up in a force field. So instead, thinking of it as a process where we try a bunch of ideas roughly in parallel, test those ideas out as quickly as possible, see which of those look the best, and then go through the fitting and more detailed test process and then release the best of those. So we're finding that it's hard to know in advance what's gonna give us the best thing for our buck. Um, so it's better to try a bunch of things in parallel and let the science drive what actually makes it into the force fields. Um, and so for example, we had been, we'd spent a bunch of time working on Weber bonder interpolated torsions, which are still a good idea and show some promise, but it's not quite ready for mainstream and release yet. So we've deferred that from the stage release. On the other hand, some of our bespoke fit tools and another idea you'll hear about based on driving parameters from quantum mechanics via modified seminario approach kind of came from an unexpected place and look like they're gonna impact what we're doing in the short term, even though they weren't really on our roadmap. So these are things that are turning into key parts of our force field, even though they were developed in parallel. So um, with that, oh yeah, also I wanted to mention we're also starting to collaborate a lot more broadly. Um, this, and you'll hear a little bit more about the many different people outside Open Force Field Initiative who are using the software. And I think that'll play a key role in long-term sustainability. And sometimes that leads into people formally partnering us, partnering with us, like Danny Cole's group. Um, yeah, so Jeff, over to you and on to the next slide. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, Right, so I'm Jeff Wagner. I'm the tech lead for Open Force Field, um, and I will be giving the infrastructure part of the talk for the next 10 or 15 minutes. I'm structuring this part of the talk around our major priorities. Uh, and so since I've started here, we've had, I think, more work to do than we've had hands. And I've had to identify kind of what is Open Force Field's value stream. Uh, I think it's not sufficient to just make a new force field and then expect people to use it. I think the three pillars are that the force field needs to be good, that people need to believe that it's good, and that people need to be able to use it for the problems that they care about. And so I'm structuring my talk around these three priorities. Uh, I'll be discussing how our infrastructure makes it easy to use force fields, makes it easy to compare force fields, and makes it easy to create force fields. 
So let's start with making it easy to use force fields. What the normal user wants to do is take a molecule and a force field and just run a simulation. And our big bottlenecks here are getting people to start using or integrating our software and getting the software to work well when they do try it. We help people to start using our software by having great examples and documentation. Uh, we recently brought on Josh Mitchell, he's over here on the middle right, to help update our documentation and expand and refresh our examples. So over here is an example uh, that Josh Mitchell worked on uh, getting uh, into our public GitHub repository. This shows how to run a protein ligand simulation with an amber protein and an open force field ligand in a box of tip 3P water with some ions. For developers who want to use our package as a library inside of theirs, um, without but they don't want to pull in all the optional dependencies and the graphic stuff and the, the user facing things. We've made a bare bones base conda package that they can use in their own package recipes. Uh, for people who have been following our release notes and channel announcements, you've probably seen this, but over the past year, we've made a lot of bug fixes and minor improvements uh, basically on a rolling basis to the open force field toolkit and our other packages. And also, I'm learning more about being a good citizen uh, in the open source software ecosystem. And I want to clarify that this number being one instead of zero is not a major accomplishment. Uh, we don't want to be breaking the API on a regular basis, but I do want to acknowledge that we did. And in the future, I'm hoping that we can keep this number as close to zero as possible. Uh, the reasoning for breaking the API this year was that um, we wanted to make more room in our Python namespace for the other open force field software that's being developed. And so we changed our import path from, uh, from open force field import to from openff.toolkit import. Uh, this makes room in our namespace for the other open force field software that'll be coming out like openff.evaluator and openff.qcsubmit. And in the long run, we're optimistic that this can reduce user confusion when we have many major pieces of software uh, by associating them under this top level namespace, but then giving each of them their own module path underneath that. Finally, we're in the process of developing functionality to load and parameterize proteins using a Smirnoff format force field. Uh, this is going to be the foundation of our upcoming biopolymer fitting efforts. This is really exciting. Uh, some of the code is there, it's still in the prototyping phase. So we're using it internally. Uh, and soon the science team will be able to start parameterizing proteins with it. Uh, but for users, I recommend that you wait another few months until this makes it into a stable release, unless you really like pip installs and uh, extremely obtuse error messages. Now, reliable distribution and installation are fundamental to making our software really truly usable. Uh, you might remember a few months ago that Anaconda, the company Anaconda, was getting a little bit dodgy with licensing. Uh, and we realized that if we were able to move our packages and dependencies fully onto ConduForge, we could, resume, we could resolve this ambiguity around licensing and avoid making all of the companies that want to use our software go through separate contract and legal reviews with uh, Anaconda, the company. Further, we realized that moving to ConduForge has a bunch of technical benefits, basically a huge number of small improvements that in some will really improve the user experience and expand our platform compatibility. So in late 2020, we started investing a lot of time and energy into working with the OpenMM team, as well as actually contracting a ConduForge maintainer to help move our packages over. Um, this effort was largely spearheaded by Jaime over here on the right. Um, he uh, did such a good job that he actually got hired by the company that we contracted to, um, and now he's becoming a major ConduForge maintainer himself. I think the biggest payoff from this, though, is that now we no longer need to spend engineering effort inside of the open force field to maintain the Omnia channel. That was something that would break unpredictably, and it was hard to schedule other things around because of the complexity of fixing it sometimes. Hey, Jeff, can I ask a quick question? It's right. Uh, we might keep questions for the end if that's okay. Okay, no problem. Thanks. 
So we don't want to make open force field software do everything in a research workflow uh, because other people have made really good specialized tools and it would sort of be a waste of time to try and replace those. But we do want to interface smoothly with the adjacent tools that people would want to use in a workflow. So over here is the standard workflow for using open force field to parameterize a molecule. Um, the intake for our software, the way that you get a molecular topology or a molecule object in open force field format is using our dkit or OpenEye. And that, uh, those tools are already pretty well suited to fit into a workflow. We have some special additional needs for open force field molecules compared to general molecules, but for the most part, the intake is operational right now. The output is a bit more of a question. So our current native output format is the OpenMM system. And when people want to integrate the outputs from open force field into their workflows, there's some ambiguity. Um, it's not clear if they should move their whole workflow to use OpenMM or if they should uh, kind of take some number of paths through ParMed to get to the format that they want. Uh, and I'm thinking that this ambiguity was probably a very large barrier to people who were trying to slot open force field into their workflows. So to resolve this, we're working on replacing our use of the OpenMM system object with a new object called the OpenFF interchange being developed by Matt Thompson. Um, so here are the differences that we replace the OpenMM system with the OpenFF interchange. And this is going to have native writers to all of the uh, major biophysics formats. And what this will let us do is control the flow of information without needing to squeeze through ParMed, uh, which is already kind of stretched past its original design scope and um, requires more than the developer resources that are available to it. Uh, now, eventually, these lines will be bidirectional, so we won't just export to these formats, but we'll also be able to import them. Um, however, the importing part is going to be more difficult, so we're focusing on the exporting first. The interchange object will keep track of the provenance of each assigned parameter, which will let us do post-assignment parameter modification. So in the current OpenMM system, if we want to change the length of a particular bond, and we try to do that, it only changes the length of that instance of the bond in the resulting system object. But in the interchange object, we'll be able to change the length of the underlying bond parameter and have that change propagated through every use of that bond parameter in the whole object. Uh, this might not seem very cool, uh, but it's actually really exciting for what it will let us do with our force field fitting. Also, the interchange object will have native writers out to a number of machine learning formats. And this is exciting because it brings us one step closer to fully differentiable force field optimization. And that will let us take all the, the effort and the engineering that's gone into modern machine learning infrastructure and kind of use it as a hammer with which to beat our current uh, specific field um, fitting problems. So on the previous slide, I mentioned that we're designing our software to become part of a workflow. And success in how well we've done this is hard to measure. Um, for the first few years, in fact, we were just sort of throwing software releases and force fields into a void and hoping that someone was using them. We've engaged in a few direct collaborations since, for example, with uh, the MOSDEF efforts at Vanderbilt and other institutions. And those are going well, but what we'd really like to reach is spontaneous adoption of our tools and force fields. And what's been neat in the past year is to see some of these results start sprouting. So there's companies like Cresset and OpenEye, and if you look at their recent release notes, they're starting to support force fields and use some of the open force field tools. Uh, we have formal collaborators, including MOSDEF and the Rowley and Cole Labs, as well as several others. Uh, we have unaffiliated groups around the world. So for example, this is the Pele uh, Free Energy Approximation Program made in Spain. Uh, and it was a joy to see one day that they had started using the open force field infrastructure. Uh, and we've been in, in occasional contact with them to, to help them get integrated. Uh, and probably what's coolest for me on the open source side is that if you do a search, like a text search for from open force field import or from openff.toolkit on GitHub, 
you start finding bits and pieces of our examples and our API in repos that we've never heard of from people that we've never talked to. And that I think reflects really well on our efforts to make our software and force fields easy for people to use. So now I'd like to talk about how we're making it easy to compare force fields. And so back in 2020, uh, the open force field team had been talking about how to get people to try using our stuff. And basically it's a chicken and egg problem where the people we care about have finite time and they need to spend some of that time using our stuff to be convinced that it works, but they won't spend that time unless they already think that it works. So earlier this year, we started an effort to automate the Victoria Lim and David Hahn force field study. And our goal with this was to let people test our force fields on a data set of their choosing in as automated a fashion as possible. David Dotson made this great figure to explain uh, how our automation works. So the user comes up with one or more molecules defined in 3D with at least one conformer each. We use our dkit to generate up to 10 conformers of each molecule. We do some sanitization and validation to make sure that these molecules are suitable to be handled by MM force fields. Then we run a QM minimization of these molecules using Psi4. And for each QM energy minimum that comes out, we run MM minimizations using a variety of force fields. Uh, from the results of those MM minimizations, we see if they stayed close to the local minimum identified by the QM minimization, and also whether those MM force fields correctly rank the relative energies of those different conformers. And finally, a summary reports generated. So we reached out to a number of companies that are working with us on this study. And each company that's participating submitted some non-proprietary 3D compounds uh, directly to us. And we're running those, uh, we're running the workflow on those in, in public. Each company is also running a separate data set of their choosing internally. And we're collecting only the summary statistics from the results of the automation running on that to produce a big pooled study. So I'm optimistic that this has people seeing the performance of our force fields and tools on molecules that they care about and on infrastructure that they have access to. One thing that I think was surprising about this was how smoothly the distribution of all this software went. So we packaged the Open Force Field Toolkit, OpenMM, the Sci4 Quantum Chemistry Software, QC Engine, QC Submit, and the little lightweight CLI front end on top of all of it. And people at different companies were actually able to install this and feed in their molecules and have thousands of quantum chemistry optimizations executed locally. Uh, this was super cool. And I think it worked really well because we had a really good team working on it. Uh, and because we've been developing our software with such internal consistency that these things kind of become Lego bricks that you can snap together and ship out. And what I think more users care about than conformer geometries is um, inter or intermolecular and simulation-based properties. Now tackling these is more than a processing problem because there's also a data collection aspect to it. So whereas drug-like molecule geometries are kind of plentiful in different crystallographic databases. Things like bulk molecule mixture densities and protein ligand uh, binding free energies require a lot of curation. So for setting up and running simple property simulations, Simon has created basically this death star of a solution called OpenFF Evaluator. And this automates a whole bunch of physical property calculations um, the current extent of this is showed in this table, but it's it's changing a lot, and more and more of these check marks are coming in every week. For protein ligand calculations, David Hahn has been curating a database of protein ligand complexes with known binding energies, as well as a machinery to programmatically access and iterate over them. So you can run your, your protein ligand for energy calculations in a loop. Uh, this is the foundation of a lot of our benchmarking efforts using different free energy frameworks. Uh, so there's been some work that we've been doing to get results on protein ligand stuff, but this side is a lot more effort and compute intensive. So the automation still has a little ways to go before this becomes totally routine. Uh, but while this protein ligand stuff is being built, 
Simon's property evaluator is fully automated and ready for use both in benchmarking or if you hook it up to a force balance optimization loop, force field fitting. And we'll be hearing about that during Simon's portion of the talk. Now, finally, I'd like to talk about making it easy to create force fields. Our force field training and experiments require a lot of QM data. And to generate the volume of quantum data that we want, we've started really heavily automating the submission of data sets to QC archive. So there's some extra work that you need to do when you're submitting graph molecules for quantum chemistry jobs when you're doing force field work because you need to make sure that you're getting the same graph molecule out at the end as you put in at the beginning. Uh, with these data sets, there's also a lot of information entropy and you don't know ahead of time whether this data set you're submitting now will just be a dead end experiment or if in several months it'll become an important artifact that's part of our force field release. So in the first year or two, we didn't really have standards for how to record reasoning and settings for data sets. And so a lot of our initial work on QC archive no longer has the notes or context that we need to understand it today. But thankfully, Trevor Goki uh, drafted some standards for our data set submissions moving forward. And this was based on his lessons learned from sort of being an archeologist among those early data sets and having to, to figure out, uh, like to reverse engineer the reasoning behind them. Simultaneously, Josh Horton has been working on the QC submit package, which makes it a lot easier to submit and retrieve graph molecules from open force fields data sets on QC archive. And David Dotson has started automating huge swaths of our job and compute management infrastructure using QC archive. So here's an example. This is a GitHub repository that David Dotson maintains called QCA dataset submission. And this is a project board where each one of these items is a pull request containing a bunch of molecules that were submitted to QC archive. And they're all in different categories. So some of them are currently being computed. And because we use a lot of preemptible compute, sometimes the errors that we get are just because a job was killed um, because a higher priority job took its spot. So we have error cycling. Um, sometimes we reach the end of a data set and a lot of the molecules just won't finish and we send it back to the original scientist and make sure that the questions that they asked made sense. Uh, and then we keep track of the end of life and final review for these data sets. What's neat is that this automation goes through every day. And for every data set that's currently running, you get a report of how far it's gotten. So this is um, a report from a few days ago showing that 872 torsion drives of a submission had been completed, whereas 15 were in the error state. Uh, these torsion drives break out to a number of optimizations each, and so there was a total of 55,000 optimizations that had been completed. Um, this is all totally automated, which I think is super cool. And now we're starting to hit a really good pace for quantum data set creation and processing. And finally, in the Open Force Field Toolkit, we spent a lot of the first two years laying the groundwork for different types of parameters and functional forms. So we've added support for virtual sites, um, different partial charge methods other than AM1, different BCCs other than AM1 BCCs. Uh, now we can define them using a smart space grammar. We've got Viberg bond order interpolated torsions and bonds supported, as well as more technical support for molecule subclasses for folks who want to make uh, types of molecules that have additional functionality from our base molecule. We've also started seeing some examples of research code maturing into production. And this last year, we saw this for the packages CMILES and Fragmenter. Uh, these were codes that were used by Haya Stern's research. But after she graduated, they had maintenance needs and feature requests that were hard to coordinate with everything else that was happening in the software. But at that point, we basically realized that with her paper out, the behavior and interfaces for these tools were fleshed out in such detail and they were in such a stable state that it was straightforward to refactor their functionality using the open force field toolkit as a backend. So now these are available again. Um, and in the case of Fragmenter, now it's no longer OpenEye dependent. We can use Amber tools as a backend. Our force field package also made the jump to ConduForge, and now it's under the name OpenFF force fields. And with this change, we've automated a lot more of our force field release process. So one exciting thing is that just like how if you have a bug report from a user in your code base, you make a regression test to, to ensure that you don't add it back later, we can put in simple regression tests for 
things that pop up in simulations and catch recurring problems before they go out in a release. So for example, OpenEye had reported a problem with propine substituents uh, in HMR simulations, and now we've added a test to make sure that we can't break that again. And over here on the right, this is another example from Josh Mitchell um, showing how the toolkit can be used for force field modification, um, where we learned that Pinocchio was a real molecule all along. And so now that we're starting to talk about changing parameters, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Simon, and he'll talk about the fruits of all this labor. And are you stopping sharing? Oh, sure. Yeah, there we go. Cool. Thanks so much, Jeff. Just uh... Get the slides up now. Oops. Okay, awesome, thanks. So I really wanna start my part of the talk kind of overlaying the amazing science that's been done by Open Force Field by really reiterating the core mantra of Open Force Field open software, open data, and open science, because really it's these three core tenets which are rapidly facilitating the force field science that open force field is doing, as well as the incremental improvements that are being made to its force field. The open software, as Jeff, as Jeff has mentioned, so we now have a near fully automated pipeline for training, testing, and analyzing new force fields and force field hypotheses. What may have previously taken whole teams of researchers and engineers weeks is now becoming possible for a single researcher to explore in days using these, these fully automated pipelines. The open data aspect, you know, open force fields commitment to open data and especially building tools to curate high quality training and test sets from open data sources like the quantum chemical archive for quantum chemical data and the NIST thermome archive for experimental physical property data is really allowing open force field researchers to focus more and more on the science rather than the tedium of data curation. Really this ability to cherry pick from high quality, highly curated pre-existing data sets or rapidly create new ones where missing and contribute them back to the community has been fundamental to a lot of the work which I'll hopefully show through these, these slides. And then of course the science this combined software and data infrastructure has made the process of exploring new force field science almost routine. We can now readily start from some new hypothesis. You know, should we be including virtual sites? Do we need a polarizable charge model? Have the software in team integrate the necessary infrastructure to answer the questions if it's not already supported? Have then the science team perform whole matrices, tens and tens of test force field fits without much human intervention, assess those force field fits against the well curated standardized test sets, especially those that are being provided by the industrial partners as, as Jeff previously mentioned. And finally, make data driven decisions for if, how and when these new force field ideas should be incorporated into the mainline open force field force fields. Really, I really wanna show over the course of my slides that this process is working and it's really enabling incremental improvements to the open force field force field, as well as enabling a wealth of new force field science. And so in particular, I think a fantastic example of this process working, even though the science perhaps isn't quite there yet, are these fiber bond order interpolated torsion parameters. This really started from these fantastic ideas and observations made by Haya Stern and Christopher Bailey, that the quantum chemical torsion barrier height has this strong correlation with the Weiberg bond order. So the idea is, well, why can't we take our force field classical torsion force constants and also interpolate them based on this Weiberg bond order to capture this effect? to capture non-local electronic effects and to conjugated effects directly in our torsion parameters without needing to introduce hundreds of new parameters for all the many different edge cases. 
So based on this idea, the software team were able to add support to the Open Force Field Toolkit for computing by-by bond orders. They were able to add support for interpolated torsion parameters. The science team then, Jessica Martin, Pavan Bahara especially, were then able to use this infrastructure to perform tens and tens and tens of new force field test fits, exploring all things from hyperparameters to fitting targets to which chemical series may best benefit from these interpolated parameters, especially those which maybe exhibit uh, conjugation effects. And then equally for each one of these test fits, routinely assess how the performance of the interpolated parameters were changing things against standardized quantum chemical methods based on the work of, of Victoria Lim and David Hahn. Okay, so ultimately what was found from these assessments that limitations in other areas of the force field, especially the electrostatic interactions and non-bonded interactions, were really starting to introduce noise into these wonderful correlations that were, that were observed. And ultimately at this point precludes and hindered fitting the torsion parameters to these beautiful signals. And so based on the data, it was decided not to include this aspect of force field science yet into the mainline force fields and not include it yet into SAGE. But I just want to stress that, that even though the science hasn't necessarily yielded the expected performance improvements yet, given that we have all of this high degree of automation, we can continue to revisit the scientific ideas as other areas of the force field improves, again, applying this same process and when the data ultimately says that this science is ready to make it into the force fields, then we can incorporate it because ultimately open force field is about making these data driven incremental improvements to their force fields. And I think Parsley has been a real positive example of this because it's had a number of incremental improvements since it was first released in 2019. And as David has spoken about, things like the valence parameters being retrained against a fully redesigned quantum chemical set to enable better coverage of chemical space or particularly better performance on those regions of chemical space which are most of interest, especially pharmaceutical relevance. They've had incremental releases based on user feedback. So it was identified that the geometries of urea containing molecules were perhaps poorly reproduced. So a new release of Parsley was made to address that. It was identified that the force field may be yielded pathological behavior for triple bonds when simulating with hydrogen mass repartitioning. So a release was made based on that to resolve that. And it was identified that perhaps the geometry of sulfonamides was perhaps not well captured by the force field. So an incremental release was made to address that. Time and time again, we've been able to either based on new science or user impact, improve parsley force field. And this now leads us to the next stage, which will be the SAGE force field. So the next incremental generation of open force field. And SAGE is really gonna focus on a retrained set of Van der Waals parameters trained against physical property data alongside continued improvements to the valence parameters. And ultimately SAGE is an important stepping stone, especially in determining the methodology for how these Van der Waal parameters are gonna be retrained, an important stepping stone towards the ultimate goal of a self-consistent biopolymer and small molecule force field. And even beyond that, just a self-consistent force field, be able to take ligands and amino acids and sugars and lipids, hopefully just have a force field that all of that can be thrown at it and it handles them well because everything has been trained in a self-consistent manner. But for now, SAGE is still focusing on the methodology and building up that small molecule force field, even though it's building towards the self-consistent biopolymer and small molecule force field. And so I mentioned SAGE is going to be the first open force field force field, which contains a select set of retrained Van der Waals parameters. And these Van der Waals parameters have actually in the release candidate been trained about, uh, against uh, mixture properties, which was inspired by a previous piece of open force field science, especially entropies of mixing and binary mass densities. Previous work by open force field has shown that when you just train your Van der Waals parameters against pure properties, one can introduce these systematic errors into complementary interactions. 
So in this figure here, I'm showing some previous benchmarks that were done against entropies of mixing. And it was found using our previous force field, whose van der Waals parameters ultimately came from these pure property fits, show these systematic errors in being able to capture alcohol and ester and alcohol and ketone interactions, these strong complementary interactions given the, the hydrogen bond donor and acceptor aspects of them. But it was shown that as soon as you start training against entropies of mixing and binary mass densities, one can be able to begin capturing the complementary interactions present in the system and start to remove these systematic errors. And just on the trend of capturing complementary interactions and why we think mixture properties will be so important moving force field to open force field force fields is because it allows you to capture in single training sets whole wealths of interactions. One can trivially incorporate into the training set mixtures containing solvents with ligands, ligands with amino acids, amino acids with sugars and solvents. And in this way, your training vector can capture all of these potentially many diverse range of interactions. So although parsley, uh, although SAGE is focused still on the small molecule uh, training sets and interactions as a methodology and a pathway forward, we think mixture properties will allow us to start to incorporate these kind of self-consistent interactions, which would be critical to yielding an accurate biopolymer small molecule force field. So new science based on OpenFF science going into to SAGE. But one thing I also want to stress is that this is actually quite a technical achievement. And, and it's again, open force fields, dedication to open software is facilitating this kind of work because the SAGE training set contains about a thousand of these binary mixture uh, properties. So a thousand entropy of mixing and, and densities data points. So if one thinks how one would naively kind of compute those, it would be about two simulations each for the pure phases and one for the mixture phase. So about 3000 molecular simulations that maybe would be required to evaluate this data set. Multiply that by the number of training iterations. So for SAGE, it was about 15. That's about 45,000 molecular simulations that, simulations that would essentially have to be set up, run, analyzed, and then incorporated back into some force field fit. By having the OpenFF evaluated frameworks, which can routinely curate data sets from the NISTOM ML archive, and then takes care of all of the implementation details of actually estimating that, we can evaluate these large training sets and even go larger without minimal human interaction. So the SAGE training set about a thousand data points, but really facilitated by this great software that the open force field has built out. And in this vein of being able to fit, uh, using mixture data to fit small molecules with other components, SAGE also begins to include some aqueous mixtures where we've included fits, including the fixed tip 3P water model. So our small molecule force field is beginning to in some ways see the water model as part of the fits, even though we're not retraining it yet. Although retraining a water model is definitely on the roadmap. And so by doing these refits against mixed properties and in the release candidate of SAGE, we are beginning to see some really nice positive improvements. We've been benchmarking against uh, both solvation for energies and non-aqueous to aqueous transfer for energies, which we hope would be in some ways at least somewhat representative of something like a ligand unbinding from a protein and then being transferred into a solvent. And this is based on subsets of the free solve and Minnesota solubility data sets. So on these plots, I'm showing the non-aqueous solvation for energies, the aqueous solvation for energies, and the non-aqueous to aqueous transfer energies and the RMSEs of those for GAF 2.1.1 plus the AM1 BCC charge model for parsley 1.3.0 and also the SAGE van der Waal parameters which went into the release candidate. So even though one maybe doesn't see statistical significance, if one digs a bit deeper and looks at chemical moieties, one can find statistical significance in, in certain chemistries improving, but in general, there does seem to be a positive, train, a positive change after retraining the van der Waals parameters. And of course, there's some caution required here because there's always going to be some missing terms if you're just using a fixed force field when evaluating these properties. And of course, when we begin to self-consistently start retraining the van der Waals with an electrostatics model, which I'll mention a bit later in the talk, we we'll begin to see hopefully even larger improvements here. But in general, we do think these mixture properties are not only helping to improve the van der Waals parameters, they should give us a sustainable pathway in beginning to build up a self-consistent biopolymer and small molecule force field and then beyond. 
So it's not just the Van der Waals parameters that we've been working on for SAGE. We've also tried to go back and reevaluate, well, how can we improve the valence parameters incrementally at the same time? And there's been a couple of approaches that we've taken here. And so one of them is looking at, can we expand on the torsion drive training data that are included in the valence fits? And this is work that's been really pushed forward by Heisi Zhang, but this was based off an observation made during previous fits and during the Viberg bond order work that if you include torsion drives in your training set, which are influenced heavily by strong steric or electrostatic interactions, and you have deficiencies in your electrostatics and non-bonded models, which we know we do have, you can essentially introduce easily artifacts into your torsion parameters. So Heishu has been looking at, can we design a small yet chemically diverse torsion drive data set, which doesn't include these strong steric and electrostatic interactions, and mainly exploring this by trying to combinatorially combine small chemically diverse fragments with a single bond and do a torsion drive across that bond. So unfortunately, while great strides have been made in this, this area, and we've done a couple of test fits based on these and assessed them against quantum chemical data, uh, the data is showing that these, this new approach to designing the torsion drive set isn't quite ready, and it's not yet ready to be included in SAGE. Um, so it is coming on the horizon. It does look like it's a promising approach, but for now, there's still, still work to be done. But again, it was explored using this. We had the idea. We're able to do test fits based on the new data sets that Heishu Pichang uh, put together and that was able to compute using the distributed infrastructure. We made the data-driven decision and we were able to explore. What actually we have been looking at for Sage though is, well, okay, if we just take the data that went into Parsley, so our second generation data sets, can we actually get more mileage out of it? So previously we've been training against things like optimized geometries, torsion profiles and vibrational frequencies, all kind of equally, somewhat equally weighted, but do we and should we be training against all of those targets. You know, what happens if we don't include vibration frequencies? What if we swap them out with directly training Hessian data? What if we derived our force and angle constants directly through something like the modified seminario method? What if we changed the relative weighting of these contributions to the data? And even from the data itself, what happens if we start to filter some of the torsion drives by removing those which have strong steric interactions? What if for the optimized geometries, we don't just take in all of the conformers that were given? What if we only try and retain the distinct conformers. So just by looking at the Parsley data and re-evaluating and doing tens and tens, I think there's over 20 test bits that have been done here and assessing every single one of those against quantum chemical data, as well as some protein ligand data, we've been able to see some yield, some significant improvements in the SAGE release candidate, even though the data is very similar to what went into the 1.2 and 1.3 releases. So on this slide, I'm showing hopefully some of these significant improvements that we're seeing, significant improvements to optimized geometry derived targets. And these were, if you've been part of the industrial partner benchmarking project, these kind of plots will look very similar to you, but it's using the molecules which were contributed by our industrial pharma partners. Um, so here I'm showing histograms of a number of metrics. So in particular, the RMSD between the minimized QM and MM structure for a range of different force fields, including the GAF 2.1 force field, the open force field 1.2 force field, the 1.3 and the SAGE release candidate. So definitely seeing some significant improvements in the SAGE release candidate. Again, just by having explored how we use the data that we're training against. In terms of delta uh, energy differences between the QM and MM conformers, again, again, we do see relatively good performance from the SAGE release candidate actually been going from, say, oh, parsley 1.2 to 0 to 1.3 to 0, it seems like there was perhaps a slight regression in performance, but in going from 1.3 to 0 back to the release candidate, it seems like we've resolved that regression and, and improved things whilst also improving uh, conformer-based properties. And same with TFD, which is kind of like a, a weighted internal coordinate RMSD, so significant improvements from the, the SAGE release candidate here. Again, this was all born out of this process of just exploring and using our automated infrastructure to perform tens and tens of test bits, benchmark on the, validate on quantum chemical data, and ultimately benchmark on this larger set. And we are seeing these nice incremental improvements in SAGE that we were hoping to observe. And so while SAGE and, and in general open force field force fields have mostly been benchmarked, at least on the QM side, to 
optimized geometry, quantum chemical data, we're rapidly looking to see what other quantum chemical metrics could we employ as part of the force field assessment to see whether our force fields are yielding positive improvements and if we're pushing them in a positive direction. So one of the things that we want to look into is how well does our force field begin to reproduce things like torsion drives. So one of the metrics is we've started to, based on the Jacks ligand set, take, uh, take the Jacks ligands, do a bunch of QM torsion drives, do a bunch of MM torsion drives, and then for each molecule in the set, to compute the RMSD between the MM and QM profile and calculate the average over the set. And this is the metric shown here for 1.2, 1.3, and the Sage release candidate. So hopefully this kind of metric gives some idea of the relative magnitudes alignment, how well the relative magnitudes of two torsion profiles match up. We've also been looking at, well, what if we take the QM and MM uh, torsion profiles and first scale them and normalize them by their maximum barrier height and then calculate the average RMSD between them and average over them. This is a kind of a metric which we found yields a relatively good correlation with how well does the shape of two torsion profiles match, even if they may have significantly different magnitudes. And again, our force fields kind of look like they're doing reasonable here, but the idea is more exploring the metrics for, you know, is this a good metrics for assessing performance against torsion barrier profiles. And just in general, I think as the, con the consortium would love more feedback on, and we'll hear a bit more in the discussions later, but what kind of metrics do people want to see the force fields assessed against? Because anything we can do to improve performance where users need it most is something that we would love to include incrementally into our force fields. So another idea for a metric that we want to assess is kind of a finer grained metric based on kind of optimized, in some ways geometry is not necessarily optimized. And it's really, we'd love to be able to compare, well, how does the geometry of specific chemistries compare, maybe minimized or simulated between QM and MM, because hopefully this will allow us to detect earlier some significant problems that we've seen in previous force fields. And I wanna give a, a case study of one of these now, as well as showcase how Open Force Field was able to use its automated process to overcome this. And the issue was identified first by pharma partners, and especially a couple of weeks ago, OpenEye came to us and they said that they'd been doing some binding free energy calculations. And they were noticing that in calculations where ligands contain sulfonamide chemistries, as part of their, sulf their, their simulations, they were observing that the sulfonamide valence angle was decreasing to about 75 degrees when simulating with 1.3.0. And this wasn't present when they simulated with 1.2.0. And so they kind of hypothesized that maybe this geometry issue was yielding to, to, to problematic binding for energy calculations. So after that was identified, open force field was able to diagnose that between 1.2 and 1.3, two angle parameters in particular seem to have decreased somewhat maybe unphysically. They were able to triage the problem by rolling back those parameters. And I think the day after I'd had a conversation with, with OpenEye, we had an alpha release of a new force field out, we provided it to OpenEye, and they were able to go and redo their binding for energy calculations. So while the geometry seemed to have been resolved by this triage fix, unfortunately, the, the binding ligand free energies maybe weren't quite so resolved. But I just want to show that, again, based on farm upon input, within a turnaround of almost a day, we've been able to provide a triage solution. And actually, when we went back to revisit this problem through Sage, uh, it seems like the release candidate also does not have this issue due to the redesigned training data that it was trained upon. So not only do we have a triage release, we have a longer term solution for Sage just by varying the data that was trained against. So the process of we had the idea, we managed to do a test, uh, we, we fixed the problem, we were able to test it and then release a fix, I think is, is fundamental and something if people are identifying issues with the force field, we'd love to hear about so we can fix them and include the fixes in our release. And so the other metric, which I think we'd like to assess, and I'm sure many people would like to see assessed, is it'd be fantastic, it would be a game changer, really, if we could routinely incorporate protein ligand binding free energy measurements into the assessments of force field, especially as we're doing these tens and tens of fits, which are becoming routine for us, if we can assess them against many protein ligand binding affinities, especially when we're starting to retrain the biopolymer force field, this would be fundamental in hopefully improving performance there. 
So as part of the Sage release, as more just a, a starting to scope out whether this would work well into our workflows, we have been benchmarking each one of these tens and tens and test bits against a tick to Jax ligand set using Percy's mainly as a, as a sanity check to make sure that things are not deviating too much. But we don't want to just be focused on one target. Ultimately, we'd love to do either the full Jack set and beyond to David Hahn's protein ligand benchmark. So there's going to, a lot of conversations have been had and we're trying to invest heavily in adding support to folding at home so that we could essentially get access to their wealth of compute power and ultimately and essentially allow benchmarks against even many test force fields and make it routine part of the force field validation and assessment cycle. So hopefully this should be coming in the future. But if this does pay off again, it could be a game changer in terms of allowing better improvements to things like protein ligand affinities as the very part of the force field fitting process. So open force field sage, the next incremental generation of open force field force field, which contains retrained van der Waals parameters, which seem to be yielding improvements to things like solvation and transfer free energies, retrained violence parameters, which seem to be yielding improvements to optimize geometries and perhaps also being able to produce torsion profiles, continuing the cycle of incremental improvements and, and in general, a stepping stone to the ultimate goal of the self-consistent small molecule biopolymer and everything else force field. And this release candidate is now available on GitHub, but in the coming days, we'll also be make, working to make this available as part of the open force field, force field uh, package to make it easily usable and testable. So this is all of the work that's gone into Sage, but now I want to take a bit of time to walk through some of the amazing science that's also been done in parallel to what's been going into Sage, because there's a lot of really nice being facilitated, again, by open force fields, data sets and infrastructure. And one of these really nice and kind of unexpected cases was kind of led by one of a, a collaboration with the, the Cole Group and by, by Josh Horton in particular. And it's the idea that can we take essentially a methodology which gets used routinely in bespoke fits and to a generalized force field. In particular, the modified seminario method which gets used by the Cole Group essentially allows you to derive bespoke bond and angle force constants directly from quantum chemical Hessian data. So the idea is, well, can we just do a bunch of these calculations for a large set, average over them, and use these as the general bond and angle force constants? So Josh was able to pull down all of the Hessian data made available by the open force field using KubeKit, the package that he created with the Cole Group. Um, they were able to compute a bunch of bespoke angle and bond force constants, average over them, and actually the values that they yielded seemed reasonably sensible, especially for triple bonds. The values for the force constants seem to be a much more commensurate with what you'd expect and what you'd need to kind of reproduce things like vibrational frequencies. Once Josh had reached out with these kind of idea to me, within about a day, we've been able to apply the machinery of the open force field and refit, keeping the kind of average bond and angle force constants reasonably well trained. We've been able to refit an entirely new force field or all of the valence parameters in a new force field. Within about a further day, we're able to retest that force field against our large quantum chemical sets that the industrial partners had provided. And ultimately what we saw from those is that while one seems to get better force constants, which match better with vibrational frequencies, one also did see reasonably similar performance to uh, what we'd got out from just allowing the force constants to be fit to things like torsion drive and optimized geometry data. So again, from going from hypothesis to entirely tested force field, and now we're iterating it on this approach with the core group, um, in a couple of days really i think shows the power of open force process and infrastructure and open data availability and look forward to exploring more of this science and seeing if we can begin to incorporate it into the mainline force fields additionally as well as retraining van der Waals parameters, a big interest in the open force field is retraining the electrostatics models. So while AM1BCC has been kind of the workhorse of a lot of calculations over the years, but especially for the open force field force fields, the idea is we'd love to take the bond charge correction parameters and start to retrain them against new quantum chemical and even explore co-optimizing them against quantum chemical and experimental data 
and the Van der Waals parameters all at the same time to yield a self-consistent charge and non-bonded model. And so the process for this is currently ongoing. All of Christopher Bailey's wonderful AM1 BCC charge, uh, SMIRX, uh, bond charge correction parameters have been ported into a smirks based language, which are made available in the OpenFF recharge package. The ability to train these BCC parameters against both quantum chemical data and experimental data has been integrated into the fitting infrastructure by adding support to evaluator, force balance, and open up recharge. Test fits are currently being performed, building on previous open force field science, especially the work of Mike Chaparral and his RESP2 methodology, exploring training these things to a mixture of vacuum and implicit solvent quantum chemical data, as well as mixture entities and densities, which are being used for the Van der Waals. And we're currently in this cycle of training and testing against currently solvation and transfer free energies, but maybe expanding this to a broader set of test data as well. And we hope to share how that's going in the, the next couple of months. Along the same vein uh, of trying to improve these electrostatics models, Trevor Goki has been leading the efforts to explore, again, this base idea of how much improvement can one get by including off-site charges into a force field? Does their inclusion justify perhaps the introduction of new particles, which may yield perhaps slower simulations? So based on this hypothesis and following the process, which Open Force Field does its science by, Trevor's currently ended support to the Open Force Field Toolkit for virtual sites, and he's currently working on adding support for training those virtual sites against both quantum chemical data and hopefully eventually physical property data. And this fitting infrastructure should be available in the following weeks. And the next step will then be to, again, follow along and use this fitting infrastructure to perform many test fits against quantum chemical data using similar approaches to what are being used with the BCC parameters to see if they're yielding improvements to the force field and ultimately make data-driven decisions should virtual sites be included in open force field force fields or is the complexity not worth the expense. So hopefully have some more information than this in the, in the coming months. Another big area for open force field is the ability to train bespoke parameters for molecules which people are most interested in. And this has really been pushed forward again by, by Josh Horton, who built open force fields bespoke fitting package. And hopefully this package should be available within the next one to two months. But currently it's been shown that it can retrain well a bespoke set of torsion parameters for the JAX ligand set. And especially it can take advantage of the wonderful work that Haya did in fragmenting a molecule in such a way to retain the chemical information around the torsion and fit to the torsions to fragments of an original molecule, thus improving the, the performance of the bespoke fitting. And it does look like from the work Josh has done that these bespoke torsion refits and introducing bespoke torsion parameters for, for certain molecules is yielding an improvement to um, the general force field. So it does look like things are working. So while we want to make available the fitting package, which currently can support bespoke fitting torsion parameters, our work's being done and looking, can we expand this to other valence times as well? Can one fit things like force constants to the modified seminara method? Or especially a big one, which we'd love to explore more and is currently being explored is, well, instead of generating bespoke quantum chemical data for each of the fragments that the torsions are being trained to, can we just use a machine learn potential like Annie2x to generate the bespoke data that's being fit to and in such a way significantly reduce the cost of bespoke fitting while hopefully still yielding the relative accuracy benefits. So hopefully looking forward to this in the next couple of months. And there is more, there is so much more. So Trevor Goki and, and the work that I've mainly been speaking about is just the stuff that's coming in the near term future. But Trevor Goki in particular has been working on automatic chemical perception, you know, trying to automate the process of when and where do we need new parameters. Owen Maiden has been looking at can we train surrogate models to predict physical properties as a function of force field parameters to take the cost of evaluating physical properties from days down to seconds, which would be a real game changer in terms of speeding up the force field science that we can do with things like Van der Waals refitting. Hei Su Zhang has been doing beautiful work on figuring out different ways that we can include Hessian data into our fits that maybe avoid the artifacts that we've sometimes found vibrational frequency data to introduce, especially by projecting the Hessians along internal coordinates before, before doing the fits. Uh, Jeff Setiadi has worked on 
not only getting host guest binary dependency sorting uh, support into the OpenF evaluator, but also being able to compute the gradients of host guest binary dependencies and is currently using the support he added to OpenF evaluator and force balance to do training fits against host guest binary dependencies. Jessica Mott is building off her previous work with the Viber bond order interpolated proper torsion parameters and is looking, can these be generalized actually to improper torsions as well, where improper torsions shouldn't suffer from uh, such artifacts from things like steric and electrostatic interactions. And she's done some really nice work in showing that actually the degree of planarity around amines is strongly correlated with the Viberg bond order. So looking if we can capture that directly within a force field to capture these kind of improper, uh, uh, these kind of like planarity dependent Viberg bond order and, and chemical environment effects. Pavan as well as working with Jessica on the WBO work has also been revisiting our level of theory that we're training and testing the force fields against. And also looking into, uh, or is starting to look into um, things like, well, can we also use things like a machine learned potential, some, something like Annie to also be generating our train data so that we could rapidly expand the size of our training sets without necessarily rapidly expanding the cost of generating such data. So, like I said at the start of the talk, Open software, open data, open science is rapidly facilitating the force field science, which open force field is doing. And as I've hopefully shown with Sage, is really facilitating the incremental improvements that are being made to the force field. And as addition to incrementally improving the force fields themselves, is generating a wealth of parallel force field science, which we hope will eventually feed back into the force field and yield significant improvements there. And so with that, I'll hand back over to David Mobley for concluding remarks. Thanks. Yeah, so just to kind of sum up, um, we're really excited the Sage release candidates um, is available and, and looks promising on diverse data. We just done to do a little bit more testing and before we, before we release, but uh, it's really exciting. And we've been really excited and pleased with the, the work everyone has done and including all the partners on this automated benchmarking and really uh, working together as a group to do this with all the industry partners. We're also excited about the level of community uptake we see both with and without our help um, because we see you know, this is an effort where we benefit, the initiative benefits the more the more people are using it because you know, that will feed back into more improvements that come from the community. We're also excited about new technology that's coming online, whether it's stuff we deliberately built to improve force fields or stuff that uh, comes in unexpectedly, like some of this modified scenario approach um, and how that appears to result in improvements. And we're excited about the bespoke torsion and a variety of other things that we'll be able to let you start trying out very soon that look like they're going to provide accuracy gains. Um, Simon, can you go on to the next one? Okay. Um, and then we would you know, really, we should acknowledge almost the whole community about um, the work that's gone into this. So there's too many folks in our initiative even to list, um, but then also we're indebted to the Amber Forcefield community, the GAF and GAF2 developers, um, and to everyone who supported this financially, both before this formally started, NIH and NSF funding that paved some of the way, um, the Open Forcefield Consortium and NIH for funding work that we talked about today, and Mulsi and others who funded fellows fellowships, graduate student and postdoc fellowships in our groups for work that has interfaced with this as well. Um, next slide. And uh, if, if someone wants to drop the link to that form in the chat, that would be great, Jeff or Carmen. But yeah, so there's potential follow-up workshops that we could have on this or follow-up talks rather that we would schedule at times that work for you. So you can use this Google form to vote on different things that you are interested in hearing more about. Um, bespoke fitting, um, what that would look like, how we're, we're at the details of how we've actually been working through optimizing and troubleshooting and trying to improve force fields and where that might be going. Um, 
reviewing the benchmarking, on reviewing the benchmarking infrastructure, how we can improve it, what we could, could go on next, uh, what we should be looking at there. And then also some demo session, like our interva interfacing with uh, QC archive using QC submit and so on. So feel free to vote there. And next slide. Okay, so now is when we switch to questions. So um, feel free to launch into questions on the talk at this point. You can either throw those in the chat or speak up. Oh yeah, and now we start recording.